Uh, so I'm Rongan Chatterjee from uh, the UK, and I am a National Health Service GP. I'm a whole food advocate, and occasionally I appear on BBC television uh, to talk about various health matters. And uh, when I was invited by uh, Rod and Jeff to come and speak at a low-carb conference, I thought, OK, that's great. I'm excited. That sounds, uh, sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, but I thought, what can I talk about? And I'm very passionate about the microbiome. And I appreciate that this may be a tad controversial in areas, because this is new science. But I think we know enough to start applying some of the science that we know. And how can we incorporate that in a low-carb diet? So I have been a practicing MD for nearly 15 years now. And I started off being a hospital specialist. I did my certification exams in internal medicine and started off in nephrology. But I was getting a little bit frustrated with how super specialized that I felt medicine is becoming these days. And I felt that I wanted to take a step back and see the whole picture. So I moved into general practice, certified in that. And frankly, it was the best decision I ever made. I love it. You get to see all kinds of problems, all kinds of people. And you get to build relationships, which is what I feel medicine is also about, as well as getting people better. And the more I practice, and it's nearly 15 years now, the more I realize that nutrition and lifestyle should be the bedrock upon which all medical treatment for chronic disease should be founded. And not all my colleagues agree with me, but my experience has taught me that that's the case. And I really had the privilege this year, well, last year, actually, um, of making a series of documentaries for BBC One, which is our big channel. It was a prime time show. And the premise of the show is, what happens if you have more time with your doctor? Because the average primary care consultation in the UK is 10 minutes. And I got to spend four or five weeks with patients, with the whole family, in their house. And look, these results are things that you guys have probably seen many, many times before. This wasn't a low-carb show. There were three families on three different episodes, but two of them had diabetes. And so by virtue of that fact, they became low-carb shows. Because in my eyes, the only way to treat type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome or abdominal obesity, or at least the first port of call for treating them, should be a diet low in refined and processed carbohydrates. And what was great about this is that 4 million watched each show in the UK. And these are people who may not read the journals, who may not read the newspapers, who may not read the news, but saw a family go through this process, how difficult it was, what they found easy, what they found hard, and see profound changes. So Dottie, 36-year-old, these guys were hooked on fast food. And She'd been to the doctor many times, but she'd not been for about nine months. And on my sort of initial set of bloods, we diagnosed diabetes. Now, I'm just giving you the headline news, basically. There was a lot more to it. But her HbA1c was 7.3. We confirmed with a fasting glucose. She was 276 pounds. And literally within four weeks, her HbA1c was down to 5.8. She'd lost 30 pounds. By the time the show aired, She'd lost another, another 30. And now I got a text from her a couple of weeks ago. She's almost lost 100 pounds. And we only finished filming six months ago. So she's doing great. It is sustainable. And uh, this is the question that people ask, you know, is it sustainable? But of course it's sustainable if you empower people, if you educate them. The other family was slightly different. This was an established diabetic, 49-year-old chap. He had diabetes, type 2 diabetes for 12 years. He was on multiple medications, three diabetic medications, metformin, glycoside, and cisagliptin, as well as a statin and lisinopril for blood pressure. Now, again, within four to five weeks, and there were a few challenges for a variety of reasons which came out on the show, but waist circumference, 39 to 34 and a half inches, weight down by 25 pounds, HbA1c, within the first week I took him off, sulfonylurea, uh, the glycoside, and his DDP4 inhibitor. So he was just on metformin because I had planned to fast him. And I'm a big fan of uh, Jason's work. And that was really the strategy I used with him. And again, within a few weeks, significant improvement. So this 
It's the kind of stuff that got me into trouble with the British Diet Dietitians Association in the UK. <laughs> And they released a statement criticizing my unsafe strategies. Uh, didn't appear to be that interested in the results, um, which I would have thought would be the primary objective. Um, but then we have a, another association called BANTS, the British Association of Nutritional Therapists. And they released a statement saying how pleased they were with uh, the advice that I'd given on the show. So I guess this sort of, sort of polarizes opinions. So that's just a little introduction. but. I did an immunology degree at university, and I love all the stuff that's coming out in the microbiome and how diet impacts the microbiome and it impacts our immune system. And I'm going to try and bring some of that into how I think we can apply that within the realm of the low-carb diet. So I love this paper. This is uh, from 2014, no, sorry, 2011. And it, I don't know if everyone knows what the gut microbiome is. I assume a lot of you do, but just so we're clear right at the start. The gut microbiome is a term given to describe the vast collection of symbiotic microorganisms in the human GI system and the collective interacting genomes. Recent studies have suggested that the microbiome performs numerous important biochemical functions for the host, and disorders of the microbiome are associated with many and diverse human disease processes. Now, we don't know everything yet. It's still early science, but I think it's exciting. Modern technology and systems biology recently have established the importance of the gut microbiome in the disease pathogenesis for numerous disease states, including obesity. And the same paper has a lovely graphic where they look at various parts of the body, various diseases, and where there is an association with imbalances and problems with your microbiome. Doesn't mean we know how to fix it yet, but it's, I think it's very, very fascinating. Now, Many of you may be familiar that there's a figure quoted that we have 10 times more microbial cells than human cells. But actually, if you look at it a bit deeper, recent estimates suggest that the human gut contains between 30 trillion and 400 trillion microorganisms, whereas the human body has an estimated 37 trillion cells with a considerable range. And so based on these approximations, we could have a one-to-one -one ratio with microbial cells, or, or they could outnumber our cells by 100 to 1. But the question is, what is a healthy microbiome? Because I don't think we necessarily know the answer to that yet. And we're studying a lot of ancestral tribes to find out you know, what happens if your gut is untouched by modern living, modern food. And it's pretty hard to do. And I think a few years back, we used to think it was to do with what species, what bugs live there. But an emerging paradigm is that diseases such as obesity and inflammatory bowel disease are associated with reduced diversity. So many of you here, I'm sure, are very pro certain concepts within the paleo community. And the Hadza tribe in Tanzania are a tribe that are still hunter-gatherer and are relatively untouched by modern living. And it's, it's well, when we studied this, it was really interesting because what we found is that we've lost approximately 50% of the diversity that these guys had. And there's multiple reasons why that is. Rapid environmental transition and modern lifestyles are likely driving the changes in the biodiversity of the human gut microbiota with clear effects on multiple processes for our health, alterations in the gut microbiome and intestinal homeostasis have the capacity for multi-system effects. So there's an emerging paradigm, and I'm using a lot of papers. I appreciate that. But it's to show that this is up-to-date modern science. We haven't all got the answers yet, but I think it's fascinating. And the field of gut microbiome research has already moved from the idea of describing the core species to identifying the core ecological functions various microbes perform. Many species may fulfill any given role. So there's another concept emerging, which is the keystone relationship. The interaction between fiber and microbes that consume it is the fundamental keystone interaction that everything else is built on in the gut. 
It may lie at the heart of the symbiotic pact between microbes and humans. So this is a little graphic just to show that there is a three-way interaction going on when you eat food. There's your diet, but what you eat has an impact on those gut bugs. And those gut bugs have a subsequent impact on your immune system. It's bidirectional communication. And this is a great paper from 2003. And it really is about the concepts that within our gut, approximately 70% of immune system activity we think resides in or around our gut. And the mucosa, so the gut mucosa, the lining, is directly exposed to the external environment and taxed with the antigenic loads consisting of commensal bacteria, dietary antigens, and viruses at far greater quantities on a daily basis than the systemic immune system sees in its lifetime. I think that's a profound statement. It's saying that there's more immune reactions going on in your gut every day than the rest of your body in its lifetime. And the job of the immune system, most of the time the immune system job is not to respond. That is immune tolerance. We don't want it to respond, but as we all know, food allergies, food intolerances, many things are increasing in number for a variety of reasons, and the immune system has lost its tolerance. So how can we get immune tolerance? How can we get back to that? I am a big fan of a diet low in refined and processed carbohydrates and higher in good quality fats for a lot of my patients, not all of my patients, but those with type 2 diabetes, those with abdominal obesity, those with insulin resistance, absolutely. But what's interesting about this, what can we do? It's all fine presenting the science, but what can we do in practical terms with our patients? Well, what is it that improves Akimatsu mucinophilia? It's onions, it's garlic, it's leeks, it's artichokes. Yams will come too, because um, obviously starchy veg can do it as well, but I think in various cases we've got to be a bit careful with that. Chicory roots, agave, uh, green bananas, dandelion greens, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, broccoli. See, I recommend these things on a low-carb diet. And I think the term low-carb, personally for me, whilst I think it works as a public health message, it's simplistic, but we've have the low-fat diet. We've demonized a whole food group for many, many years. So when I talk about low-carb, what I mean, and I appreciate not everyone in the room talks about it like this, but I mean a diet low in refined and processed carbohydrates, but I don't mind a diet that's got slow carbs in them. These are the carbs that are bound to fiber, because I think that fiber is important for the microbiome, and I think it propagates an anti-inflammatory phenotype through the immune system. So that's what I do with my patients on the, on the show, as well as cutting out completely your pastas, your breads, your rices, your grains. I said, look guys, try and eat five portions of veg a day. I wasn't talking about starchy veg, okay? But I do, if people improve their metabolic status, I personally increase Things like sweet, I say sweet potatoes twice a week, a small amount. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. And I get good results with that. And I appreciate guys here are getting very good results with nutritional ketosis. Someone said to me, do you use ketosis? I don't know. <laughs> I've never measured. I'm pretty sure I do, because if you're eliminating all those refined and processed carbs, and actually like the first family, she found it hard to have the vegetables. I'm almost certain, from what I'm hearing here, that she was in ketosis. And one thing I'm looking forward to learning this weekend is what the benefit for me is to measure whether my patients are in ketosis, because currently I don't do that. I'm getting good results without doing that, but I'm truly fascinated by hearing so many other reports here. So maybe I'll change my practice. But I'm basically trying to say that when I go low carb, I increase slow carbs as well. Because I think long-term, 
There's a lot of science now which is showing that they are very beneficial for our microflora. I think you could do both. I think you could do low carb, and I think you can feed your microbiome. I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I really don't. I think lots of groups, we fight about a lot of different things. The paleo community, the low carb, high fat community, you know, 90, 80, 90% of it is the same. We fight about the 10% that's different. And the problem with that is the public get confused. You polarize opinion with the public, they don't know who to believe anymore, whereas a lot of what we're saying is the same. So I'm wrapping it up now. I appreciate there's a lot of science there, but I was hoping to sort of say in practical terms what we can do with that science, which is basically eat more veg. Um, and this paper from uh, 2009, I love the statement, the composition of the microbiota can shape a healthy immune response or it can predispose to disease. I think you guys will like this quote. I certainly hope so. I've tried not to be too controversial, although I'm sure I'll be heckled later for some of the things I've said about fiber. Um, but from 2013, about 75% of the food in the Western diet is of limited or no benefit to the microbiota in the lower gut. Most of it comprised specifically of refined carbohydrates is already absorbed in the upper part of the GI tract and what eventually reaches the lower part, the large intestine, is of limited value, as it contains only small amounts of the minerals, vitamins, and other nutrients necessary for maintenance of the microbiota. I think most of you probably agreed anyway that about 75% of the food in the Western diet is junk, if not more, probably. <laughs> so I talked to my patients about max, about increasing their intake of max. I don't mean big max, I'm talking about <laughs> these kind of max, microbiota accessible carbohydrates. That's the term in the literature. These are the carbohydrates that are resistant to host digestion and actually feed your gut bugs. So I say, I want you to increase more max, but it's these kind of max, I give them a list. Again, I'm a doctor who, I'm interested in clinical results. I use the science, I use the research to guide me, but it does not dictate me, because medicine is more complex than that for me. It's about reading the patient in front of you, seeing where they're at, seeing what they want to do, and seeing how you can help them. So, I hope you found it interesting. I hope it stretched some of us. Um, I'm hoping it's things that a lot of you have not heard before, because when I was invited to speak, I really did feel, yeah, I could talk about insulin, I could talk about hormones, um, and I'm a big fan, but I thought, you know what, I'm also a big fan of the microbiome, and I think it's relevant, and I think it will become increasingly more and more relevant as the science emerges. So I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to leave you with a photo of a place I like to ski, a place called Chamonix in France. And uh, that's where I spend a lot of my winters. And uh, yeah, the skiing here is almost as good as there. So thank you very much. <laughs>